Hello, and welcome back. If you missed our first video, we did a reading of chapter one, Les Mes. Today, I'll be reading chapter two. Monsignor Muriel becomes Monsignor Welcome. And with that, let's get to it. The Episcopal Palace of Denue adjoins the hospital. The Episcopal Palace was a huge and beautiful house built of stone at the beginning of the last century by Monsignor Henry Pugent, doctor of theology of the facility of Paris, Abbey of Seymour, who had been Bishop of Denue in 1712. This palace was a genuine signorial residence. Everything about it had a grand air. The apartments of the bishop the drawing rooms, the chambers, the principal courtyard, which was very large, with walks encircling it under arcades in the old Florishines fashion, and gardens planted with magnificent trees. In the dining room, a long and superb gallery, which was situated on the ground floor and opened on the gardens, Monsignore Pugent had entertained in state on July 29, 1714, my lords Charles Brulart de Genlis, Archbishop, Prince d'Ambrun, Antonin de Mesgrigny, the Capuchin, Bishop of Grasse, Philippe de Vendome, Grand Prior of France, Abbey of Saint Honor de Lorraine, Francois de Burton, de Crillon, Bishop, Baron de Venice, Caesar de Sabron, de Forcalcor, Bishop Signore of Gladev, and Juan Sojin, priest of the oratory, preacher in ordinary to the king, Bishop, Signor of Senez. The portraits of these seven reverends personages decorated this apartment and this memorable date, the 29th of July, 1714, was there engraved in letters of gold on a table of white marble. The hospital was a low and narrow building of a single story with a small garden. Three days after his arrival, the bishop visited the hospital. The visit ended. He had the director requested to be so good as to come to his house. Monsieur, the director of the hospital, he said to him, how many sick people have you at the present moment? Twenty-six, Monsignor. That was the number which I had counted, said the bishop. The beds, pursued the director, are very much crowded against each other. That is what I had observed. The halls are nothing but rooms and it is with difficulty that the air can be changed in them. So it seems to me. And then, when there is a ray of sun, the garden is very small for the convalescents. That was what I said to myself. In case of epidemics, we have had the typhus fever this year. We had the sweating sickness two years ago and a hundred patients at times. We know not what to do. That is the thought which occurred to me. What would you have me, Monsignor? said the director. One must rein oneself. This conversation took place in a gallery, dining room, on the ground floor. The bishop remained silent for a moment. Then he returned abruptly to the director of the hospital. Monsieur, he said, how many beds do you think this hall alone would hold? Monsignor, the dining room? exclaimed the stupefied director. The bishop cast a glance around the apartment and seemed to be taking measures and calculations with his eyes. It would hold full twenty beds, he said, as though speaking to himself, then raised his voice. Hold, monsieur, the director of the hospital. I will tell you something. There is evidently a mistake here. There are 36 of you in five or six small rooms, 
There are three of us here, and we have room for sixty. There is some mistake, I tell you. You have my house, and I have yours. Give me back my house. You are at home here. On the following day, the thirty-six patients were installed in the bishop's palace, and the bishop was settled in the hospital. Monsignor Muriel had no property, his family having been ruined by the revolution. His sister was in receipt of a yearly income of 500 francs, which sufficed for her personal wants at the vicarage. M. Muriel received from the state, in his quality of bishop, a salary of 15,000 francs. On the very day when he took up his abode in the hospital, Monsignor Muriel settled on this disposition of this sum once for all in the following manner. We transcribe here a note made by his own hand. Note on the regulation of my household expenses, written in liveries. For the little seminary, 1500. Society of the Mission, 100. For the Lazarus Amontadir, 100. Seminary for Foreign Missions in Paris, 200. Congregation of the Holy Spirit, 150. Religious Establishments of the Holy Land, 100. Charitable Maternity Societies, 300. Extra for that of Arles, 50. Work for the amelioration of prisons, 400. Work for the relief and delivery of prisoners, 500. To liberate fathers of families incarcerated for debt, 1,000. Addition to the salary of the poor teachers of the diocese, 2,000. Public granary of the Hots Alps, 100. Congregation of the Ladies of Denu, of Manosca and of Cistron for the gratuitous instruction of poor girls, 1,500. For the poor, 6,000. My personal expenses, 1,000. Total, 15,000. Monsignor Mario made no change in this arrangement during his entire period that he occupied the Sea of Denu. As had been seen, he called it regulating his household expenses. This arrangement was accepted with absolute submission by Mademoiselle Baptistine. This holy woman regarded Monsignor of Denu as at one and the same time her brother and her bishop, her friend according to the flesh, and her superior according to the church. She simply loved and venerated him. When he spoke, she bowed. When he acted, she yielded her adherence. Their only servant, Madame Maglore, grumbled a little. It will be observed that Monsieur the Bishop had served for himself only 1,000 livres, which added to the pension of Mademoiselle Baptistine made 1,500 francs a year. On these 1,500 francs, these two old women and the old man subsisted. And when a village curate came to Denue, the bishop still found means to entertain him, thanks to the severe economy of Madame Maglore and to the intelligent administration of Mademoiselle Baptistine. One day, after he had been in Denue, about three months, the bishop said, And so I am quite cramped with it all. I should think so, exclaimed Madame Maglore. Monseigneur has not even claimed the allowance which the department owes him for the expense of his carriage in town and for his journeys about the diocese. It was customary for bishops in former days. Hold, cried the bishop. You are quite right, Madame Maglore and he made his demand. Some time afterward, the general council took this demand under consideration and voted him an annual sum of 3,000 francs under this heading, allowance of Monsieur the Bishop 
for expenses of carriage, expenses of posting, and expenses of pastoral visits. This provoked a great outcry among the local burgesses, and a senator of the empire, a former member of the council, of the 500 which favored the 18 Brumaire, and who was provided with a magnificent senatorial office in the vicinity of the town of Denue, wrote to Monsieur Bigot de Premenu, the Minister of Public Worship, a very angry and confidential note on the subject, from which we extract these authentic lines. Expenses of carriage? What can be done with it in a town of less than 4,000 inhabitants? Expenses of journeys? What is the use of these trips in the first place? Next, how can the posting be accomplished in these mountainous parts? There are no roads. No one travels otherwise than on horseback. Even the bridge between Durance and Chateau Arnaud can be barely support oxen team. These priests are all thus, greedy and avarice. This man played the good priest when he first came. Now he does like the rest. He must have a carriage and a posting chase. He must have luxuries like the bishops of the olden days. Oh, all this priesthood. Things will not go well, Monsieur Le Comte, until the emperor has freed us from these black caped rascals. Down with the Pope. Matters were getting embroiled with Rome. For my part, I am for Caesar alone, etc., etc. On the other hand, this affair offered great delight to Mademoiselle Maglore. Good, she said to Mademoiselle Baptistine. Monsignor began with other people, but he has had to wind up with himself after all. He has regulated all his charities. Now here are 3,000 francs for us, at last. That same evening, the bishop wrote out and handed to his sister a memorandum conceived in the following terms. Expenses of carriage and circuit. The following is listed in liveries. For furnishing meat soup to the patients in the hospital, 1500. For the maternity charitable society of Aix, 250. For the maternity charitable society of Dragunium, 250. For foundlings, 500. For orphans, 500. Total, 3,000. Such was Monsieur Muriel's budget. As for the chance episcopal prequisites, the fees for marriage bans, dispensations, private baptisms, sermons, benedictions of churches or chapels, marriages, etc. The bishop levied them on the wealthy with all the more asperity since he bestowed them on the needy. After a time, offerings of money flowed in. Those who had and those who lacked knocked at M. Muriel's door. The latter in search of the alms which the former came to deposit. In less than a year, the bishop had become the treasurer of all benevolence and the cashier of all those in distress. Considerable sums of money passed through his hands, but nothing could induce him to make any change whatever in his mode of life, or add anything superfluous to his bare necessities. Far from it, as there is always more wretchedness below than there is brotherhood above. All was given away, so to speak, before it was received. It was like water on dry soil. No matter how much money he received, he never had any. Then he stripped himself. The usage being that bishops shall announce their baptismal names at the head of their charges in their pastoral letters. The poor people of the countryside had selected with a sort of affectionate instinct. Among the names and pronouns of their bishop, 
that which had a meaning for them, and they never called him anything except Monsignor Benvenu. Welcome. We will follow their example, and will also call him thus when we have occasion to name him. Moreover, this appellation pleased him. I like that name, he said. Benvenu makes up for the Monsignor. We do not claim that the portrait herewith presented is probable. We confine ourselves to stating that it resembles the original. That was chapter two, everyone. Let me know what you thought. Leave us a like and a subscribe. Thank you for listening to the Acolyte Podcast.